Good morning. I hope you're all doing really well today. And it is great to see all your smiling faces again, especially you. My name is David Paris, and you're watching The Caffeinated Bible. And I've been teaching seminary and doing theological research for over the past 30 years. And the goal of this channel is to take what I've been doing within the four walls of the classroom and break that open and make it available to a lot more people. So if you enjoy these videos and you find them useful, be sure to subscribe, give it a thumbs up, and I'd really appreciate it if you share it and let other people know about it as well. One of the things I wanted to remind you of right at the very start is Crossway Publishers has sent me this wonderful English Standard Version Study Bible. This is about a $60 value. I highly recommend it, but I am giving that away for free on the channel. And in order to have a chance to win it, you have to look at the notes underneath the video here. So if you want a chance, be sure to enter. I will be announcing the winner next week. Now my last video was on Halloween and I'll put a link to it up here or it's underneath here, but you can take a look at that. That was a lot of fun to make. I was originally thinking about moving into a biblical text for this Sunday, but this Sunday, All Saints Day falls on Sunday. And because that's such an important day in the liturgical and lectionary year, I thought I would go into the history of All Saints Day, what it's about, and some perspective for it. But before we get started, we need to grab a cup of coffee and let's jump into this material. observed by all the churches that follow a lectionary or a liturgical calendar for the year. And it falls on November 1st, directly after All Hallows' Eve, or what we would call Halloween. And it's part of sort of a three-day cycle. Halloween, or All Hallows' Eve, which is what my last video was about, All Saints' Day, and then All Souls' Day. And some conflate All Souls Day and All Saints Day together. It really depends on the church that you're worshiping in as to how they see these three days fitting together. Some of the denominations that observe All Saints Day include the Roman Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, the Reformed Church, Lutheran and Methodist churches, and Presbyterian churches sometimes. The difference between All Saints Day and All Souls Day can be kind of broken down along this rough category. All Saints Day remembers all the people who were martyred within the church. And All Souls Day remembers all the faithful who have died and gone before us. So there's just a slight focus between the two. And you can understand how some churches and denominations have conflated the two days into one day of observance. So let's dive into the history behind All Saints Day. And I find this really quite interesting. And I hope you do as well, but my job in this video is to make it interesting to you. So let's see if I'm able to do that. Some historians trace the development of All Saints Day all the way back to the New Testament. And they look at when John the Baptist is beheaded by Herodias, and then his disciples go and collect the body and give it a burial. And then the book of Acts, when Stephen is martyred in chapter 7, at the very beginning of chapter 8, it tells us that some devout men went and took his body and buried it. Now this respect for the dead, especially for these martyrs and collecting their bodies and burying them, they see as the beginning of All Saints Day. I don't quite see it that way. It might have a link, but I think that what you're seeing there in the New Testament text is just standard cultural courtesy practices for taking care of a dead body, especially somebody that you knew and you respected. Now, in order to explain the historical and traditional development of this day over the next 1600 days or more, I'm going to pull up a timeline here so that we can kind of keep these dates and places in order. The first thing to realize is that we really don't see much referencing or development wise as far as All Saints Day goes until around 350 AD when we have Ephraim the Syrian. And he wrote that the church should honor all the faithful who have died, but he doesn't tell us when, where, or how. About 50 years later, around 400 AD, John Chrysostom 
the Bishop of Constantinople mentioned in a sermon that high praise should be given to all who have given their life to the gospel. It really appears, even up to about 400 AD, that if this was done, it was just done in local churches. The next big development comes in 609, when Pope Boniface IV decided that the Pantheon in Rome, which was built around 29 BC and dedicated to Jupiter, should be rededicated as a church. And so when he reconsecrated this building in 609, he dedicated to Mary and all the martyrs of the church. He also instructed that on May the 13th, we should observe with a special service all those who have died for the gospel. Now the remembrance on May 13th that Boniface instituted created some problems. It became a very popular feast day during the year and attracted large number of crowds to Rome on that date. Now the problem is because May 13th falls before the spring and the summer harvest have come in, the food stores within Rome were kind of stretched pretty thin by that time. And so they were having a great deal of problems meeting the needs of these pilgrims who were coming to Rome at that time. So about 200 years later, Gregory the Great moved the day from May 13th to the first week in November. Since this day was after the harvest, they had plentiful food in stock and they were able to take care of the pilgrims that came in for this feast. Around that same time, there was a monk named Alswin who studied in Tours, France. Then under Charlemagne's edict, he went to England to become the abbot of York somewhere around 775 to 84. Now Alswin was brilliant in math and literature, and when he went there, he really started a strong reform and renewal at the monastery in York, and put York on the map as a place for learning. He used his influence and his connections with Charlemagne during this time to spread the celebration of the Feast of All Saints that Boniface had instituted across Northern Europe and into England. Around this time, it appears that either Alswin or Boniface or others really helped develop the theological focus for All Saints Day. And the focus is not so much on remembering all those who have come before us, that is what we do on this day. The focus is on the grace of God that has saved, works within our lives, and guarantees a place in eternity with Him. About 200 years later, around 1000 AD, Odillo was the fifth abbot of the monastery at Cluny. Odillo was known for his dedication to learning, but also for his giving to the poor. Several times he was caught melting down sacred vessels from the abbey in order to have money to give to the poor. He was also known for his extreme gentleness and mercy, often to the point where others complained about it. To which he is known to have replied, I would rather be mercifully judged for having shown mercy than to be cruelly damned for having shown cruelty. Odello brought a great deal of reform and renewal to the monastery at Cluny. In fact, under his leadership, Cluny became the largest and the most influential monastery in Europe. He's also responsible for strengthening and continuing to spread the observance of All Saints Day throughout Europe. In England, during the medieval period, a popular tradition was developed in association with All Saints and All Souls Day. Groups of children of the poor would go around from house to house of the better off, and they would beg for cakes or fruit. In return, they would sing a hymn or a traditional song. Some of the regions with England actually baked special cakes for this day, and they were called soul cakes. A lot of people think that this going around and singing a hymn or offering prayers by the poor in response, the better off would then give them these soul case is the origin of the practice of trick-or-treating that we celebrate on Halloween. During the Reformation, many of the Protestant leaders argued against the observance of all saint days. It was too closely associated with the medieval doctrine of purgatory for them, and so as a result, many of the Reformed leaders argued against any form or observance of All Saints or All Souls Day. However, this feast was retained in the Anglican and Lutheran churches and usually it is used as a time to remember those who have gone before us in the faith, in particular oftentimes those within that particular church. As I was researching the history behind All Saints Day, I came across a very interesting proclamation that the King of England gave in 1665. And in it, what he writes, 
is that concerning the general fast, which according to former order falleth out to be on the Wednesday, the 1st of November being All Saints Day, to be kept on the Wednesday following, beginning the 8th of that month. So he's giving you instructions when you should celebrate All Saints Day. But now watch how he extends the observance of All Saints Day and why he does it. Whereas the king's most excellent majesty did by his royal proclamation, bearing date the sixth day of July last, a point that from the time therein mentioned, the first Wednesday of every month successively should be observed and kept in all parts of the realm as a day of fasting and humiliation. So you see how he's extending it. It's not just for the first week of November. Every month, the eighth day of every month, we are to observe something similar to All Saints Day. Why? Until it shall please God to withdraw this plague and grievous sickness, and to the end that prayers and supplication may everywhere be offered up unto Almighty God for the removal of this heavy, heavy judgment. So you see what he does here. He takes All Saints Day and then uses that as a model that on the 8th of every month, the churches are to observe a special service with fasting and humiliation and special prayers be made so that this plague and this heavy judgment that has fallen upon England might be removed. Now, when King Charles II issued this proclamation in 1665, the plague was spreading throughout England, especially in London. And in a certain sense, our experience today really lines up with that. We've had over 230,000 people die in the United States from coronavirus, and we're approaching 1.5 million people around the world. The second thing is, is that if we don't take this disease more seriously and get a hand on it, by February, the CDC and other experts who work in infectious disease are saying that this number is going to be triple. In other words, instead of having 230,000 people who have died from this disease already, in February, the number is probably 750 to 800,000 people who have died. So our situation today, being confronted and challenged by the coronavirus, is very similar to the situation that King Charles was in and what he was trying to stop in 1665. In this sense, then, the remembrance of All Saints Day I think comes with particular sobriety this year because it calls us to remember all those who have gone before us, but puts us within a situation today where we find ourselves under the threat of this disease. How does all this work out? What I'd like to do to help you understand how all this fits together is put up a timeline for you. And here's the way I see it falling is that we have all those who have come before us in the past. And this is what All Saints Day is really about. We remember all of those who have come before us during this service. But right here in the present, this is when we celebrate and observe this day. But then also All Saints Day celebrates God's eternal salvation. So it has a very strong future aspect to it. So we have past, present, and future. Now what's interesting about the present is that if you say, okay, right now is the present moment, realize how fleeting that moment is. The time when I said right now is the present moment and stood this ESV study Bible up is already past. The nature of the present is that it doesn't last at all. It's like a vapor. We think we live within the present, but in all reality, it's a, just a moment that appears and disappears and we move on to the next present and the next present and the next present. So All Saints Day, by putting our present existence within our remembrance of the past and our hope for the future, helps give perspective on this very fleeting and fragile moment that we call the present that we think we live within. All Saints Day also plays a significant role in the lectionary cycle for the year. And I mentioned this in the Halloween video. If we look at the lectionary year as a cycle, and I'll put a link up here to the video I have on what is the lectionary. It starts with Advent at the beginning of December, 
Then we move to Christmas, Christmas season, then we have Epiphany, then we move into Lent, Easter season, then we have Pentecost, and then after Pentecost, we have Ordinary or Proper or Pentecost season. These are the numbered weeks up until where we're at right now. Now, during this time of proper or ordinary time, we've been reading sequentially through one of the gospel texts. And then with All Saints Day, now we have a shift in our readings because at the very end of November, we are going to have Christ the King Sunday. And on Christ the King Sunday, we celebrate Christ's future enthronement as King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and the destruction of all the force of evil. The altarpiece in Ghent is a great illustration of this as the lamb upon the altar. That altarpiece is a depiction of Romans chapter 7 with all the saints that have been martyred, past, present, and future, coming to worship the lamb who was slain but lives again. So All Saints Day begins this transition towards this end time celebration of Christ being enthroned as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. After Christ the King Sunday, then we begin the lectionary cycle all over again and we move into the beginning of the season of Advent, which prepares us for Christmas. Once again, let me just remind you, I'm giving this away. If you want a chance to win it, instructions are underneath this video here. The other thing I want to say at the bottom of this video here, you have the image of my face. You click on that. You can subscribe to the channel automatically that way. If you click on the image over here, it will take you to the video where I describe this wonderful book I'm giving away. If you click on this image down here, it'll take you to other videos I have about biblical passages of the lectionary. Until next week, peace.